And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. On Capitol Hill, speculation is growing over who President Obama will nominate to replace the retiring Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens. The 89-year-old Stevens announced Friday he'll step down at the end of the court's regular session in June. In the three days since the announcement, media speculation has centered on a short list of three top contenders to replace him, Solicitor General Elena Kagan, U.S. Appeals Court Judge Merrick Garland and U.S. Appeals Court Judge Diane Wood. But the White House is pushing back against the notion that the president has narrowed his search to just three frontrunners. Several officials have been quoted saying that about 10 candidates remain under serious consideration, but at least one name has been ruled out. That's Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton, whose name has been rumored as a possibility, but it's not being considered. White House Press Secretary Robert Gibbs told reporters in his daily briefing yesterday that President Obama has no plans to move Clinton to the judiciary branch. The White House is looking for confirmation hearings to take place no later than July, allowing for a vote before the Senate recess in August. Whomever President Obama decides to nominate will have big shoes to fill. Justice John Paul Stevens, turning 90 later this month, was nominated to the Supreme Court in 1975 and will become the fourth longest serving justice in history when he retires. At the White House, Obama paid tribute to Stevens' 35 years on the bench. He's worn the judicial robe with honor and humility. He has applied the Constitution and the laws of the land with fidelity and restraint. He will soon turn 90 this month, but he leaves his position at the top of his game. His leadership will be sorely missed. Now, as Justice Stephen expressed to me in a letter announcing his retirement, it is in the best interest of the Supreme Court to have a successor appointed and confirmed before the next term begins. And so I will move quickly to name a nominee, as I did with Justice Sotomayor. Stevens has long been regarded as the leader of the liberal wing of the Supreme Court. The Alliance for Justice said in a statement, quote, Justice Stevens has become an unparalleled champion of the Constitution in the face of the Court's increasingly conservative jurisprudential trend. He's emerged in the past decade as one of the Court's most vocal and eloquent spokespersons for individual liberty, separation of powers, and equal access to justice. Nan Aaron's president of the Alliance for Justice. She joins us today from San Francisco. And joining us via Democracy Now! video stream, Glenn Greenwald, constitutional law attorney and political and legal blogger for Salon.com. But Nair and Aaron, we're going to begin with you to look at the legacy of Justice Stevens. Talk about the key decisions he was involved in, but start off by just what he represents, having begun, well, by being nominated by President Ford. Thank you, Amy, and it's, it's good to be here. Uh, 34 years ago, he was appointed as a Republican to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, during those years, he uh, operated very much as a conservative jurist, but demonstrated, as other justices have on the Supreme Court, including recently Sandra Day O'Connor, that uh, he can evolve, and he, he is a justice who became much more open-minded, um, much more understanding of the problems that ordinary individuals, ordinary Americans face. It's interesting to me that so many people refer to Justice Stevens as a liberal icon. To me, he was a justice for all people, because particularly in later years, whether it was a case involving campaign finance reform, opening the floodgates for corporate money to spend unlimited amounts during campaigns, whether it was Lilly Ledbetter, uh, who uh, was told or found out 20 years after being at a plant that she was being paid less than, than others and not able to recover a compensation. Time and time again, Justice Stevens spoke up and spoke out for ordinary Americans on the court. Death penalty, civil rights, affirmative action. Um, 
The case of Susanna Redding involving a 13-year-old who was strip-searched for having or being accused of having Advil, um, he was a voice on the court talking about how the law interacts with, with, with individuals. And particularly now, at a time when the court uh, directed, uh, driven by Justice, Chief Justice Roberts, um, is on a campaign to tilt uh, the court in a very rightward direction in, in favor of big business, powerful corporate interests. It was Justice Stevens who spoke out, even Bush v. Gore, uh, the year 2000. His voice was the loudest, the clearest, in saying what the justice has done, had done in that decision, was wrong. So, as you said earlier, he leaves very, very large shoes to fill. And uh, we're hoping and counting on the president to pick a worthy successor to him. And Nan Aaron, talk about in the separations of power and due process issue those two key decisions: Russell versus Bush and uh, Hamden versus Rumsfeld. He's probably best known for decisions recently, that is, um, that basically extend habeas corpus to detainees, uh, as well as a very, very vocal voice against placing detainees in unlimited detention. And, of course, those decisions were rendered during the Bush administration at a time when the country was dealing with the aftermath of 9-11, and it took courage, it took independence for him to render those decisions and render them in, in the way that he did. So it's not just on issues involving corporate power, civil rights, women's rights, but probably most importantly on executive power. He will be best remembered recently for uh, trying to place some limits on expanding executive power in the, over, over the rest of government. This interesting story, when he clerked for another Supreme Court justice, Wiley Rutledge, um, collaborating with him in his lengthy dissent in a 1948 case involving the wartime detention of German-born U.S. citizens. He cited that yeah, later. Yeah, I mean, he's... Yes, absolutely. He was a justice who served in the military and from time to time would bring in experiences, principles that he had learned over the over his military years. So in fact, he was a a staunch believer in a strong military, but yet understood the importance of separation of powers and a limited role for the executive branch in certain circumstances. Um, and the issue of environmental protection, um, the uh, five to four decision in Massachusetts versus EPA in 2007, explain that decision where he weighed in. Well, there have been some very striking decisions involving EPA's ability to regulate clean water. And in, a, in two cases in the Supreme Court, uh, he stood up against the Roberts Court uh, and dissented um, in opinions that essentially reduced EPA's reach over polluters, leaving 1,500 investigations by the EPA uh, not able to go forward. Uh, Particular, particularly important in the area of the environment, to look at what the Roberts Court has done and to, again, acknowledge the role that Justice Stevens and, and some of the other moderates on the court have done to try to put the brakes on the Roberts Court again. It's an instance where his voice will be sorely missed. It's interesting. Uh, to me, uh, that many people say it's just a vote on the Supreme Court, and therefore it doesn't really matter who it replaces Justice Stevens because he was a vote. And I think from looking at his 
34 years on the court. He wasn't just a vote, but as some have said, he was a voice. So I think it's incumbent when looking at the current roster of names being proposed that we think about not just simply a vote, but who will be a leader, who will be the master tactician on the court that Stevens was, who will be willing to really to speak truth to power and to be a courageous voice on the court. And therefore, I think 